going to be reading from Galatians 4, verses 8 to 20. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, and not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. I've been realising over these last few weeks as we've journeyed through the book of Galatians together that the better we understand the kind of relationship that God wants with us, the way that he wants to pursue us in love, in commitment, in faithfulness, the more it really can have an impact on the relationships that we have around us as well, how we love those people, how we serve them, how we are gracious in the way that we act towards them. Knowing that God is unconditional in his faithfulness towards us impacts how we reciprocate that towards the people around us as well. And households and communities can be and are indeed transformed by that kind of understanding. We live in a world where there are so many natural tendencies that are on display to prove that we are prone towards self-centeredness. We're overly concerned about how we might benefit from a situation. We're willing to treat someone negatively if they don't meet our expectations. Those kind of mentalities are ingrained in us from childhood. We don't, we don't need to learn those. They're already in, in there already. Often I can be in the midst of a really peaceful situation and all it takes is for somebody to cut in line or walk a bit more slowly in front of me on the street than I want them to. And I can feel my whole disposition in that moment change completely. I think in the blink of an eye, I just show how inconsistent I am in the way that I show emotion and behaviour towards others. And Paul identifies again to his friends in these verses in chapter 4 that there is a way of experiencing, uh, a way of operating in life that is of this world. And it's fundamentally different from the reactions and the experiences of somebody who is freed by, somebody who is built on God's grace. I'll be honest, my, my frustrations, my unharnessed uh, feelings and reactions towards others can often feel like they entrap me. Paul says in verse 9 to the people, how is it that you're turning back to that restricted life? How you, you've come into contact with God. Why, why would you go back to that way of living? He wants to remind them that since they've encountered Jesus, since they've developed a relationship with God, striving for anything else, being shaped by anything else, is weak and miserable in comparison. He uses those two words. Just in case you're wondering, I, I find those words quite offensive. I find that kind of phraseology, it strikes something in, within me. Now, either Paul has been really careless with the way he uses words, or he's been really careful. Paul isn't perfect, not by a long shot. But through the letters in the New Testament that he writes to different groups of, of people, different churches, he's consistent in his pastoral, in his paternal care for those people. So I reckon it's safe to say that he's pretty careful with how he picks his words and how he chooses to give loving guidance to people. Paul is a friend who genuinely wants the best for these people. And a marker, uh, an indicator of that is he's just so committed to helping their faith in Jesus to flourish and not diminish. That's a good marker of friendship right there. I wonder, do you have that kind of friendship in life? Do you have those kind of people around you? Are you that kind of person to other people? An old friend of mine, a guy named Matt, got in con uh, contact with me lately. I haven't spoken to Matt for about 10 years, but back then... He and I were really close. For a couple of years, he and I and a, and a third friend would meet regularly, two, three times a week. 
We'd really speak about what was going on in life. We'd really share on a deep level. We'd pray about those things together. We did each other so much good. It was such a, an amazing time where I realised, because at that point I hadn't been following Jesus for very long myself, but it, they showed me what a relationship with God can look like, but they also demonstrated what a relationship with other people can look like as well. These friends spoke to me, they, they challenged me at times, and they brought me up on some behaviour and ways of thinking that were maybe difficult to receive at the time, but looking back were f- really for my good. These friends initiated something with me, and they were intentional. I can't begin to tell you how much of an impact Matt had on my life at that point. It was amazing just to, to hear from him again lately and, and for God to remind me that I had that good friendship and what it looked like and what it meant. Friends, it's just so easy to go alone in life. We think we can just do it, we can carry it out by ourselves. And I've, I've observed that that's particularly true for men. I know it's not completely true, but my observation is that men are willing to go it alone more than ladies are. The vast majority of people, I think, are quite scared of being really known. But allowing the Holy Spirit to have access to who we really are is what's required if we want to walk in new steps of freedom in the gospel. None of us are perfect, and we all need the help, the friendship with a saviour who is perfect and who is always there. You know, God wants to bring me and you out of those hiding places that we'd rather stay hidden in, the things that we are ashamed of, the things that we feel guilty about, the things that we'd rather keep hidden. He wants to bring them out from the darkness into the light because he knows that it's way more damaging for those kind of ways of thinking and behaving to stay hidden. He wants, he wants us to draw out feelings and emotions and temptations and anxieties that the devil wants us to keep hidden away and he'll often use other people as a tool for achieving that. We're invited to model something of that transparency through the depth of relationship we develop with one another too. And Paul models that in these verses. Some relationships are based around having a good time. They might be based around a stage of life or a particular shared hobby, that kind of thing. All of these are really valuable ingredients. But there is a level of care, a level of concern, a level of emotional investment that goes deeper than those things. And Paul demonstrates that here to these people. I find that really challenging and I find that really encouraging at the same time. I wonder, do you have healthy relationships around you at the moment? Maybe even just pause this video. Bring to mind those friendships and those relationships that you have around you. Just think about them. Consider how how they're doing you good or maybe doing you harm, depending on how you look at it. Do you have those people around you who you're investing in? I mean really investing in, emotionally, spiritually. And do you have the people around you who are doing that in return to you, speaking truth and life and light into your lives? Regardless of your stage of life, regardless of your personality type, we all need those kind of friendships. And in verses 12 to 14, we can see that Paul is speaking genuine love to these people. Now, this is partly because we see see it in these verses that he's previously received love from these people too. It seems that when he first began connecting with them and getting to know them, he was suffering from an an illness. We We read about that in verses 12 to 14. But they welcomed him in. They looked after him. How how wonderful is that? We have to remember that when he was journeying around the Mediterranean, when he was gathering groups of people to form these new churches, Paul was facing all kinds of enormous challenges. He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was flogged and he was imprisoned. He was living life on the road so much by himself. Remember back then there was no EasyJet, there was no Airbnb. Like Paul had to journey some hard miles in order to display the love of Jesus to others. And in these verses, he recalls those moments when he received love and care when he needed it the most, when he caught an illness of some description. And now he's reciprocating that love. He's going above and beyond because he knows that they need to receive it now as well. So in verse 15, Paul uses some quite harsh illustration to remind us or to remind them that previously they would have done anything for him. Like that he says, if you could have done so, you'd have taken out your eyes and given them to me. Now, that might sound a bit dramatic, but Paul wants to make a point. He wants to remind them that these guys used to be so for him that they would have gone to all kinds of measure, they would have done all kinds of things in order to make sure that he was blessed and to see that that was being demonstrated. Something had truly taken root in the foundations of this relationship with Paul. Better still, someone had taken root in the relationship. Jesus. 
Relationships with Jesus at the centre are stronger and healthier than those where he isn't central. That's the truth. And I know that some people might hear that and feel a bit offended by that, but it's the truth. There never has been, there never will be a deeper, purer, richer, more committed display of friendship that you and I could receive than that from Christ Jesus. None of our earthly relationships match up in comparison. If I think about my earthly relationship that I've maybe invested in the most or enjoyed the most, which would be that with my wife, even that is just a taster. It's just a shadow. It's just a sample of the faithfulness and the commitment and the sacrifice that Jesus displays over my life. In another letter, Paul famously says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. Nothing else. No thing, no relationship, no person compares to knowing Jesus. Friends, whether we know it or not, whether we believe it or not, a relationship with Jesus is our most treasured possession. He never grows tired of us. He never keeps us at arm's length. He is always for us. His love is patient and steadfast and all-embracing. We don't hold on to him. He holds on to us. If you don't believe me, just pause this video for a second and read Psalm 91, for example. Amazing truth that shows he's going to hold on to us, he's going to pursue us, he's going to be our place of refuge. Do you know, Paul wants to bring the gospel of this grace, the, the fullness of the love of God found through the surrendered life before Jesus. He wants to bring that back into the foreground. He wants that to be the relationship building thing that he has with these guys. Because Paul knows full well that it is, the, it is the primary foundation upon which a healthy relationship will flourish. You know, being closed to the grace of God, being closed to his faithfulness and his mercy, is, it damages our relationship with him. He wants us to be open to that. But if it damages our relationship with him, therefore not having grace and mercy and faithfulness at the centre of our other relationships is damaging too. Paul seems to get this. In Galatians 4, verse 19, he describes an absence of Jesus in their relationship as being like the pains of childbirth. Slightly unusual metaphor to use, perhaps, but imagine that a lady is about to give birth. There's something close by, there's something good and wonderful that's near, but it's not, it's not that yet, not, not yet there, even. But there's a pain to enjoy, there's a struggle, there's an indication that something is close, yet not fully realised. When Jesus isn't at the centre of our relationships, something just doesn't feel quite right, doesn't feel quite yet complete. Paul's description of, of a, a pain within childbirth suggests a, a not yet arrived situation. There's a discomfort in the way that the Galatians are experiencing life with one another and, and with Paul. You know, when we put other things in life, into the position that only rightfully belongs to Jesus the Saviour. We shouldn't be surprised when we feel unsettled, when we feel incomplete, when we feel an uncertainty that prevails in our relationships. When we have a, an unhealthy view of the relationship God wants with us, that lack of health, that lack of um, familiarity and trust and faithfulness, it quickly spreads into the way that we experience relationships with other people as well. Without the good news of Jesus, without his victory over all of our sin, over all of our shame, over all of our guilt, we flounder in our relationships. Relationships become unhealthy when we try and place other people and other priorities into the position that only belongs to the Saviour. We need Jesus as the rock on which to build emotionally healthy lives together. Only Jesus has the power. He's the only one with the skill. He's the only one with the commitment. He's the only one with the love to be able to sit in that seat. If you don't agree with me, why else do we have more mental and emotional health needs and concerns rampant across our media feeds at the moment? Why else is there an increasing number of children going into foster care? Why else are more families splintering and marriages ending in divorce than ever before? Why else do we feel more lonely as a people despite the fact we have way more um, ability to con connect and make connections than ever before? because we so easily forget that there is a God who loves us and who wants to shape and heal our relationships, both with him and with one another. 
All we have to do is invite him into the centre. Paul says, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. Paul's absolute salvation in Jesus leads to an affection for others and a desire for connection with others. Paul demonstrates a real level of vulnerability with these people. In these verses, he's willing to wear his heart on his sleeve with the way he addresses them. He says in chapter 4, verse 7, just a few lines before what we've read now, he reminds the Galatians of their sonship, their, their adoption into a family. But then he models, showing, he models that by showing real love and concern and pursuit after these people, like you would hope a spiritual father might do. Having care and compassion for the faith of others, it is a huge piece of evidence for the grace of God being at work in your life. Paul really cares about these people. He really cares about them because he's received a revelation into just how much God cares for him first. Friends, there is no greater purpose in life than understanding the love of God and showing the love of God to other people around us. Let me just share a quick personal story. A few years ago, I started connecting and interacting with a, a local family. The guy, he and I don't have a huge amount in common, but it became quite quickly apparent that we enjoyed each other's company. We'd speak really openly, really honestly, quite, quite quickly, actually. It wasn't just built on, did you watch the game at the weekend, or isn't the weather rubbish at the moment? Like We started to go deeper. We were willing to not just have those casual, flippant conversations, but actually speak about real meaning. And I also began to pray for this guy. I used to carry him and his family in prayer all the time. I haven't forced anything, but I've persistently just carried him. I've tried to speak truth. I've just tried to use those opportunities to meet him where he's at and allowed God to shape my heart for him. Because I don't believe I connected with him by accident. I don't believe that our lives have intersected or, or overlapped for no reason whatsoever. I think there's a great purpose behind it. Man, it's been absolutely amazing just to see how God has truly blessed them and sustained them. And at the same time, he's softened this man's heart towards the truth of who Jesus is. The, the, the nature and the victory of Jesus is now slowly becoming more and more apparent in this guy's thinking and behaviour. There will be things in this man's life that will catch him out and trip him up. And there'll be responsibilities that he's not quite sure how to handle, exactly as it is for me too. But I want to be the kind of friend who's ready and consistent to, to always try and bring Jesus into the centre of those situations, to help him to see that he, he has a rock, he has a hope, and his name is Jesus. Because when the gospel takes root in our lives, we don't just grow in our desire for the good things of Jesus to be planted in our lives, we, we want it in the lives of other people too. Some people are open to receiving that, some people are close to it at this moment. But our calling as Christians is to simply bring faith into the circumstances, into the relationships that God puts in front of us. He is the one that will bring the fruit. He's just looking for men and women to be vessels of faith in those moments. I wonder, who do you really care about right now? I mean really care about. Let's assume for a moment that we all care to a, a fairly large degree about flesh and blood. Our, our immediate family, we, we probably, most of us carry those quite deeply in our heart. But what about neighbours? What about friends? What about colleagues? What about that person who you interact with seemingly on an incidental, incidental level? God's put those people around you for a reason. Are you going to really care for them? Are you going to really carry them in your heart? Regardless of whether they show anything back in return, regardless of whether it's uncomplicated or not, why not ask someone this week, how are you really doing at the moment? and listen to what they say. How are you really doing at the moment? Is there, maybe if you want to have a particular level of boldness, say, is there anything I can be praying for you at the moment? David and Amanda, who lead our Sutton venue, they shared a concept with me many years ago, and it's really stuck. In order to flourish in all of our relationships, it's important that we strike a balance between those who are investing in us and those who we are investing in return. Now, they refer to it as an ABC friendship, but to be honest, you could call it whatever you want. An A friend is somebody who's perhaps a little bit further ahead in their, their life experience or perhaps their journey of faith. 
I'm not saying that these people are better or more valuable than you. That wouldn't be the true at all. But perhaps in their experience of life, their wisdom, their relational skills, perhaps there's just a bit more honing than you might be walking with at the moment. B friends are people who you really are at a peer level with. Similar age, similar stage of life, maybe general level of life experience is quite similar. There comes an ability to share and encourage and mutually carry one another in these relationships. Again, not better or worse than, than we are, not more valued by God, but just reading where they're at in life. And then there are C friends, perhaps younger, perhaps a little bit less experienced than you in certain areas of life, or perhaps you've reached certain aspirational goals in life that they'd like to one day hit and so they can rub off you and learn from you. Perhaps there's a depth of faith that you carry now that they'd like to one day walk in. They might look to you for input and shaping and development. To flourish with a healthy sense of balance within all of our relationships, regardless of whether we're single, whether we're married, it's vital that we cultivate a range of relationships. There may be times and in, in situations in life and all we can do is draw from others. We've just got no strength left, we've hit a roadblock, we just hit a season in life that's hard. All we can do is draw from others, but it can't always be one-way traffic. It can't always be something that we take. There's, there's an area, there's a time that we can give to. We need people around us who can appropriately feed into our lives and people who we can feed into the lives of as well in return. And Paul models that so wonderfully through these verses as he cares for, as he speaks truth into the lives of people who have clearly cared for him and carried him once before as well when he wasn't feeling well. When we understand just how much we need the love and the mercy and the grace of God, it fuels, it reorientates our desire to reflect that into the lives of those around us too. He's the comforter and he teaches us to comfort. He's the Prince of Peace and he enables peace to reign in our relationships. He's the healer who, who wants to bring health to our fractured friendships. And it's so life transforming, it's so soul enriching, it's so purpose giving when we grow in our understanding of that. Friends, God wants to know you and he wants to be known by you more deeply than you can ever imagine. Jesus endured a brutal cross on our behalf so that all of our burden, all of our sin, all of our brokenness might be lifted and a relationship with a holy and perfect God would be restored in that moment. The most loving, the most sacrificial, the most life-giving demonstration of friendship ever displayed over your life. I might not be able to physically hold the hands of Jesus right now, but boy, can I feel his presence in my life. He helps me to navigate my emotions. He helps me to be reminded of my purpose in life. He helps me to be restored in my hope day after day after day. And he's inviting us into community with one another, placing people around us in order that our understanding of him, our enjoyment of him, might grow and become clearer little by little. And if you're hearing this for the first time, you're wondering what this might look like. Perhaps you're, you're listening to this now, wondering where to go with it. I, I think you're hearing this now because God is over and over again inviting you to walk with him, inviting him into your life is the best decision you'll ever make. And as a church, we, we want to be open to people, regardless of where you've come from, what you've done, we're all on a journey towards a healthier relationship with God if we allow him in to go to work on our lives. Come and join, come and be a part of it too. Do you know, we have a devil who sits alongside our life. He doesn't reign over it, but he wants to trick us into thinking that we're unseen, that we're unheard, that we're forgotten, that we're not loved, that we're somehow meant to be in competition with one another. But there is a God who wants to know us, who wants to know that we are seen, that we are heard, that we're treasured, that we're not forgotten. And the heart of this father says, I am faithful in my love towards you. Receive it and go and love one another in return. We can find such purpose in that as we interact with one another this week. I want to encourage you, be, be open to this, be stirred by it. Let it shape your week coming up. Let me just close by praying. Father God, I thank you that you are the provider of all things, that you know what we need. 
you know who we need around us. Father, I want to pray, would you work into our lives this week where we might feel lonely, where we might feel isolated, where we might feel like we don't know what to do. First and foremost, Lord, would you help us to fix our eyes on you? And Father, would you create for yourself, for your glory, a community of believers who do one another such good and who look out with open eyes to the world around them to see who might be in need, who might be lonely, who might be in need of some friendship. May we never go inward in the way that we love and care for one another. Would we always have eyes that are looking outward for the opportunities and situations that you're placing before us in which we can be a blessing and we can bring light and life and truth where it's so desperately needed. Jesus, I ask for this for your glory and for our good. Amen. God bless.